for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible to We should always do your own homework and let us know when we're ready. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Hello. Uh, Stuart, Stuart is not with us, so I'm going to, I was, I, you know, I'm not used to doing this without an interruption <laughs> after I get out like one or two words. It's good to have you with us again, Shreya Trivedi, still from somewhere in New York City, right? Still from somewhere in New York City. Um, now I am a GIM fellow. Uh, and for those that don't know what GIM is, it's general internal medicine. It's funny, people in internal medicine are like, what's GIM? And I have to kind of explain that to them. But um, but yeah, in a much happier place than uh, working 80 hours in residency right now. I'm so excited for you. And I'm also, I think this this GIM fellowship is the first step in you creating a really cool, unique job for yourself it, rather than... Uh, you know, just keep your head down and keep going for more and more training. And I think you're going to, I think you're going to do a great job with whatever you end up in something in education, I imagine. Yes, I imagine. But right, this unique path and what that is, is, is going to be the question. I look forward to your guys' mentorship on that throughout the next two years. <laughs> no, and I, I hope you'll be kind when you're ultimately in charge, which I'm pretty sure is going to happen. <laughs> Paul, I'm going to promote you first thing I do. <laughs> Paul and I are still trying to figure out our own unique career paths, but I think that's part of what's good about staying in, in general internal medicine. You, you can have like a, a million different ways to go. Probably true if you go into a subspecialty too, but G- GIM's cooler, right, Paul? Oh, 100%. It's God's work. Paul, did you want to, we've rambled enough. Did you want to remind the audience in case we have new people listening what this show is about? Sure, I'd love to. We are. <laughs> We are an internal medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. We also do tend to just sort of talk about work life balance and, and background up front. So if you don't enjoy that stuff and just want the knowledge, um, just skip ahead 10 minutes or look at the show notes and they'll tell you where to go. But as, as I'd like to emphasize, you'll be a worse person for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Shreya, what, what is this episode about? Okay, so this is going to be a great episode walking you through nuances of Lyme disease, atypical presentations, going a little bit deeper into some of the other tick-borne illnesses, as well as some really great practical pearls from Dr. Paul Sachs. Yes, and this is going to really help you when you get the inquisitive patient asking you a million questions about Lyme disease testing. I think we're going to really give you a lot of knowledge that you'll need to answer those questions and navigate this, which should be relatively straightforward, but it ends up being kind of complicated when, because of all the options of testing available. Dr. Paul Isaks is clinical director of the Division of Infectious Diseases and the HIV program at Brigham and Women's Hospital and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Sachs received his MD from Harvard Medical School, then did residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital while continuing his postdoctoral education with a fellowship in infectious diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is editor-in-chief of Open Forum Infectious Diseases, is section editor of HIV AIDS and Up to Date on the editorial board of New England Journal of Medicine Journal Watch Infectious Diseases, where he writes the HIV and ID observations blog, which I will tell you is... Very well done and a great read and a fun read. So I would highly recommend that you all check it out. On this episode, we will be going through the topic of tick-borne illnesses, which was kind of inspired by the time of year it is, where we live here. All three of us are in the Northeast and also by some of his recent blog posts. This is a really fun and informative discussion, so I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Shrey, you got any any attempts at a pun for us? <laughs> Go for it, Matt. What's what's your pun? I don't even know what a pun is, really. I think because Stuart has said so many things that were supposed to be puns that won't weren't really puns, I don't know that I really know what a pun is. God, you guys time, are coming. This, time it just won't ticking, tick guys. you off. There's so time much is of ticking. Good. There you go. <laughs> we got to we got to move on, guys. <laughs> we did it. High fives all around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are back with Dr. Paul Sachs. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you for the invitation. Great to be back. 
Yes, we are really excited to have you back for a second time on the show. The first episode was a big hit with the, with us and with the audience, so we, we thought we'd ask you back. And in case some of the people weren't with us last time, maybe you could remind them of a one-liner about yourself. Right. Ex- I'll, I'll take what I did last time, and basically it's what my daughter, who's 22 years old and very cool, says is the right way to describe me. And that's my uh, Twitter handle, which is Harvard Brigham. ID doctor, writer, editor, educator, blogger, prefer baseball to football, pizza to sushi, and Beatles to stones. She says that captures like 90% of (laughs) (laughs) I'm curious to find out the 10%. (laughs) Well, (laughs) that's for for the next episode. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Well, how about, um, you know, so you're, you're very, uh, successful in many areas of your life. Um, tell us about a time you failed, um, at something and, and what you've learned from it. So when I was a resident, I went through the kind of mass uh, psychosis that many internal medicine residents do, which is that you think you want to be a cardiologist. So I actually thought I wanted to be a cardiologist, even after liking ID for years. And then I applied and matched in cardiology. And then I went, oh, my God, what did I do? And I, I decided not to do cardiology and I decided to do ID. So that was a mistake. I learned that you should always do what you want to do, not succumb to the pressure. What made you realize it was the wrong decision? So I was, you know, I trained in the 1980s and there was this huge ID problem. You might have heard something about it, HIV. Maybe. Um, and, yeah, and, you I've know, heard I, of it. <laughs> it, was, it was like the, the, the dominant medical story of our time. And I really found it fascinating. And I found myself drawn to the cases again and again and again. And the cardiology cases had, you know, they were interesting, but basically it was just a, like a, a pump and some tubes. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, uh, you know, deciding to do an ID. Be, do ID. Certainly, certainly, my, my motivation wasn't financial. That's for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're all, we are all glad that you chose ID and not not cardiology. No offense to cardiology, but I, I think right. you're well you're well suited for ID. It seems. Yeah, it's given me a chance to use this terrible pun, which is there's a very kind of famous nerdy ID organism called Nocardia. <laughs> Get it? Uh-huh. <laughs> That was great. Thank you. That that makes up for Thanks. Stewart's uh, puns. Yeah, that was good. That was good. It does not. <laughs> uh, tonight, tonight, Paul Sachs will be playing the role of Stuart Brigham on the show. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> I should. I forgot. I think I forgot to mention to the audience that Paul Williams. Will, we will refer to him as P Dubs, so that there is no confusion when we're talking to Paul Sachs tonight. So Paul is Paul Sachs, and P Dubs is Paul Williams. Clear. <laughs> I know Paul Williams is very uh he he loves the nickname. I don't I anticipate we're gonna be hearing much of it throughout the show. Shreya, do we have any more questions before we get into the topic of tick borne illnesses? Um yeah, let's go over um in terms of instead of doing pick of the week, let's talk about our favorite hiking experience because I think if this is the same experience I had researching, I wanted to do nothing with hiking after doing research on tick-borne illnesses. So let's just take a moment to be grateful, look back at our favorite hiking experiences. Matt, why don't you start off? I I have not been hiking that much recently, but when I was in when I was living in San Antonio in Texas, there was a in our neighborhood, there was a, this kind of trail carved through for actually power lines. And that was, that was our sad version of hiking. We would like kind of walk <laughs> through there because <laughs> I figured there was less likely. A ch- I have, I have little kids. This was my, like, I think I, at the time they were like two, two, three and five or something like that. So we're walking through and I was just terrified we were going to come upon a rattlesnake. So I was like, boys make oh. lots of noise as we're walking through the woods here. <laughs> and then we'd find the, <laughs> the puddles that we would find to like look for animals and stuff was actually just like this kind of dirty runoff water from my neighborhood. But it was, you know, outdoors, it, we were outdoors and they, they thought it was hiking. So that's my hiking experience. That's incredible. P-Dubs, what about you? Can I do... I don't, well, it's, I mean, I know to look at me, I look sort of like the rugged outdoorsy type, but I, I don't do that much hiking. I This is a tick adjacent story and not really a hiking story, but for my, my senior thesis, where I grew up in, in York, Pennsylvania, uh, hunting season was a big thing, specifically white-tailed deer. So for my senior thesis in undergrad, I would hang out at a butcher shop and wait for the hunters to deliver the freshly slain deers. And then I would comb through them for, for ixodes. And I actually freeze them in liquid nitrogen, grind them up, and run PCR. I was looking for co-infection with um, 
either Borrelia, uh, Babesia, Bartonella, and Anaplasma. That was actually my senior thesis. So I have a lot of experience um, looking at deer ticks and dead deer. Lots of There are lots of dead deer for my senior thesis. So not a hiking story, but still germane to the topic at hand. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> that's way more That's way more lab-based research than I've ever done. <laughs> hey, don't ask me what the results were. I have no memory of it. I, I think some ticks had some stuff, but who the heck knows? <laughs> that's awesome. Paul, what about you? So I um, was very lucky. I got to go to the South Island of New Zealand this past year, actually just, just in March, and hiked something called the Milford Track, which is five days, four nights, totally off the grid. And one of the things that's interesting is there are so few real predators in New Zealand that the birds are completely fearless. Mm. So you can actually like walk down a, a trail and the birds just coming right up, right up to you. And including, I got as close as I've ever gotten to an, to an owl. That was really remarkable. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I guess I'll go. Um, so my favorite hiking experience was um, back when I was young in my early 20s, my quote unquote gap year was doing a Fulbright in Korea. And my homestay family didn't speak any English. So as a bonding experience, we would go up and down a volcano almost every weekend. So that was eight hours. Um, best shape I was in my entire life was that year. Um, but at that time, I, I had no idea about tick-borne illnesses. I never took any precautions. And I, you know, thank God I'm not uh, I didn't get infected with anything or see any rattlesnakes or anything like that, but that was a, a great time. Yes. I, I learned that there's ticks more than just in Lyme, Connecticut by reading for this episode that, that, that there actually, <laughs> there's actually ticks in Europe and Asia too. I, I can't say that I was that aware of the fact before, uh, before reading more in depth on this topic. So just, just a little point of reference is that Lyme disease actually was discovered in old Lyme, Connecticut. And uh, old Lyme, Connecticut, they decided not to call it old Lyme disease because if they called it old Lyme disease, they might not, they might confuse it with what new Lyme disease is. So <laughs> it, the, the people in Lyme point that out frequently, <laughs> that it wasn't old Lyme, it was old Lyme. <laughs> I'll bet. That's great. I'll bet. Shreya, do we have a case to start this one off? Yes. Well, before we get to the cases, we just wanted to uh, say a quick disclaimer um, as Paul, uh, would tell us, you know, this is a, you know, tick-borne illnesses are a pretty serious problem, but we also understand it's a pretty controversial issue. And so we did our best with the episode to try to stay as evidence-based as possible. And also understanding with a limited time that we have on air, we did our best to be, um, diligent thinking about what would be the most clinically relevant. Paul, do you have any other disclaimers to add? I just want to underscore what you just said. This is a very, very serious problem in public health in the United States. It has been increasing substantially in all the years that I've been in clinical practice and ID. The uh, expansion geographically has been very impressive. And, uh, you know, I can't underscore enough that, that we take it very, very seriously. So we picked three clinical cases from Cashlack Memorial to highlight kind of the nuances of tick-borne illnesses. So let's start with case one. If you remember back from episode 78, uh, where we initially interviewed Paul Sachs, we talked about Mrs. R. Well, Mrs. R's son comes in today. His name is Jack. Jack is a 34-year-old male. He's a photographer. And he went hiking over the weekend. It's now Tuesday afternoon. And he has a rash on his waistband. It doesn't have any central clearing. Um, and he's convinced it's a spider bite. What's your approach to this case? Well, well, part one is that this is something that I, I think it's worth remembering is that there are really not that many venomous spiders. And most of the most of the patients who come in reporting a spider bite don't have a spider bite. And there's some sort of almost mass psychosis that, that, that you know, staph abscesses are spider bites. And so almost <laughs> always when they say it's a spider bite, it's really just like a staph furuncle or an abscess. So it's probably not a spider bite. I mean, there are some some venomous spiders, but that really isn't the topic of tonight's tonight's talk. So so it's almost certainly going to be Lyme disease. And I just say that because here we are in the peak Lyme disease season. It's, um, you know, it's, it's June, July, we're in an endemic area. And uh, this person has just been hiking. And the waistband is one of the spots that the ticks like to sort of settle in on and, and chomp. And uh, the fact that there's no central clearing is, is very important that our, our listeners and our clinicians understand that this does not exclude Lyme disease at all. And that a lot of the erythema migrans rashes don't have central clearing. A typical rash 
is uh, you know a, a gradually spreading erythematous circum you know circumferential roundish rash that sometimes has central clearing and sometimes does not. And so this story to me would be Lyme disease, Lyme disease, Lyme disease until proven otherwise. You know, a lot of times patients these days will will take a picture of their rash and upload it to either their patient portal or their their send it to you an email, whatever, and you can make the diagnosis very easily. Or you could use it. You could do uh, if you have video conferencing uh, clinical services, you could make the diagnosis. So. So I, this this to me sounds sounds like rash. I could like Lyme. I could talk about some of the other anatomic areas if you like. What what do you think? But Dr. Sachs, before you before you get there, you mentioned uh, this patient being in an endemic area. Just for the for the listeners and and honestly for me, would you mind just reminding us what the endemic areas for Lyme disease are? So the the most common areas for Lyme disease in the United States are the Mid Atlantic and New England states far and away, and then also the sort of Wisconsin, Minnesota area. But then what's happened in the last several years is that it's drifted downwards and that now we see clearly documented Lyme disease in the Carolinas, you know, obviously Virginia, tremendous amount in in, in the South as well. So it's, it's really uh, highly endemic in the places I just mentioned. Where interestingly, it's not very endemic is uh, the, you know, the Southwest, the dry Southwest the dry parts of Southern California. That doesn't stop people sometimes from those areas from thinking they have Lyme disease, but there is not very much of it. There is a lot of Lyme disease in our regions, though, uh, and more all the time. Okay. So you're saying kind of rash uh, in an anatomical area from an endemic country or an endemic area it has to be Lyme. So tell us a little bit more about the other anatomical areas. So um, the, 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 if you think about these ticks, they get on us by kind of falling off of vegetation, uh, trees, shrubs, grasses. They don't do a lot of uh, hopping. They do a little bit. And they certainly don't fly, at least not in the United States. Our ticks don't fly, thank goodness. Uh, so, so what they do is they, if they fall, they'll fall and they'll, they'll go to the, the scalp behind the ear and then any place else that they can sort of sort of settle. So the collar, the collar right here, you know, like, a, like where, where your collar touches your neck, the armpit, very, very common area, both anterior and posterior axillary fold, the waistband, the groin, behind the knee, down at the ankle where the sock touches the skin, there the sandals touch the skin, you know, all these spots that they can sort of lodge into. They, re they settle there uh, and then they start feeding. Um, I, I skipped the gluteal cleft. I probably shouldn't skip that because that's another <laughs> spot that we see sometimes. It's just you know uh, we've seen the people we've seen it on people's you know genitalia. I mean it's really it's really kind of disgusting. But people should be aware <laughs> these these are the spots that that Lyme disease happens most often on the the erythema migrans, the bite and the erythema migrans happens most often. I think that's important to point out because I was always taught to just check the scalp. And that's, you know, that's what my, like my wife has been like, the boys are outside, check their scalp. And, but yeah, really there's a, you got to check the whole body. And, uh, I think there was a great house episode about that where he like figured it out that it was a tick and it was on the genitalia. He like assaulted a patient in the, in a an elevator or something to remove the tick. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. And the tick had syphilis and the patient had lupus and <laughs> it was a trifecta. <laughs> Brilliant diagnosis. The the other thing that I thought was interesting that I, when I was reading about this erythema migrans rash is that the original case series they 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 didn't have anything to treat them with, so they just got to see the natural history of the disease and like how many people developed multiple mig uh, erythema migrans rashes, and uh, they were pointing out that this doesn't mean multiple ticks; it just means that they had. Oh yeah, it was in their bloodstream, right? No, exactly. What happens is after the primary inoculation and the rash, which doesn't always even occur, then you get a, uh, a you know, a bacteremia with these nasty critters, not the ticks, but the Borrelia burgdorferi, and you can get multiple what are called satellite lesions. And that's, that's one of the, dis one of the uh, forms of disseminated Lyme disease, as is, you know, uh, heart block, um, it's cranial neuropathies. They they are early disseminated Lyme frequently has those may have those those complications. Someone on Twitter asked, um, "What's the sensitivity and specificity of erythema migrans?" And can you speak more about that? Yeah, I mean I, it's a good question, and the sensitivity is obviously poor because there are people who have Lyme disease who never noticed a rash. Uh, so I, I can't give you an exact number, but but you know. 
but I can tell you that the specificity is pretty good um, and the predictive value positive of seeing a rash like the one I described in June or July in the uh, Northeast United States is is excellent. And I, I would I would just be very I'd be very leery of dismissing rashes as Lyme disease during those epidemiologic spikes. Be very very leery. I mean, everyone has these these anecdotes of patients who first came in with just a little bump, you know, or a little redness around the bump. And then three days later, there's a, you know, a full blown rash with central clearing right around it. And they just missed it at the outset. So that, that is something to watch for. It's really a lot, a lot about thinking of what's the epidemiology in my region and what's the, what time of year is it? Very important. Um, so, so I was just going to, so blah, blur all of that out. Nope. All gold. <laughs> <laughs> just you just become a puddle all of a sudden. Anyways, <laughs> all right. So so for Jack, what are you going to send on him? Are you going to send any labs? Can you talk about that a little bit more? So there's some debate about whether if you, let's say it, it looks to you, Lyme expert, all the world like Lyme disease. Do you actually have to send any tests? I have done it both ways. Um, part of me just wants to treat it and say, look, the diagnostic testing really isn't very very good um, in this early phase. So let's just treat it. And if there are any problems, come on back and see me. And that that really, for early cases like this, which are the ones that people who do primary care, urgent care, emergency room medicine, these are the ones that they're, they're, they often see. Um, and I, of course, sometimes I get referred them to. I mean, I remember this once, the hospital administrator who's training for the Boston Marathon, and he came to see me and he says, I don't know what this is, uh, but I had just done a long run in the woods. And is there any chance this could be Lyme disease? And lo and behold, there it was. He had Lyme disease and he had no symptoms at all. It was literally like 24 hours after he'd been in the woods. Uh, and I just treated him. I mean, it was just, there was no point to do any tests. He, he was totally fine. So I think that is very defensible um, because if you send the test and it's negative, you're still going to treat him. And if you send the test and it's positive, you're still going to treat him. So since you're not going to really change your behavior based on the result of the test, go right ahead and just treat. So with that, can you speak a little bit more about kind of the limitations of Lyme testing if someone were to get them? Um, and it was a different case scenario. Um, where would it be helpful? Where wouldn't it be so helpful? Well, I, I, you know, it is helpful in cases where, where the presentation might be atypical. Um, so if you're really not sure, and then lo and behold, it comes back positive. You know, I saw someone who was diagnosed with cellulitis uh, um, around the knee. It turned out to be, you know, popliteal tick bite, <laughs> as I keep mentioning. Um, my wife is a practicing pediatrician. She saw somebody, a 19-year-old kid, uh, and he had lower extremity edema. Um, but it all, f it all kind of or originated around the knee. Uh, so, so that was a, a, a good case for sending it because, you know, a, a monoarticular arthritis in the knee and a kid, you know, you got to rule out Lyme disease in, in Boston, Massachusetts in July. So uh, I, I think that in atypical cases or in weird cases, by all means, uh, send it. But in the just classic erythema migraines, if you see it, uh, and it looks like all the pictures you'll see on Google Images, then then go ahead. You, there's no reason to, to hesitate. Just treat it and you don't need to send any tests. And when you're when you're sending tests, can I ask you to clarify actually what, what specific serologic tests you're actually sending? Well, do you want me to talk specifically about Lyme or talk about other tick-borne infections as well? Oh, I, I think just, uh, Shreya, I was going to say actually just Lyme in this case, if that's okay, since we're still on. Yeah. So, so uh, Lyme testing it basically stinks. And it's one of the, the, the saddest things about this condition is that we have a very limited blood test for it. Um, it we, we desperately need a good antigen or PCR test. And, and the sad thing is, is that most patients with early Lyme disease don't have a positive PCR, uh, and many of them don't have a positive antibody. So the test I send when I'm thinking about Lyme disease is I send a Lyme antibody. There might be some rare circumstances where you'd send a Lyme PCR. Um, recently, we, there was someone at our hospital who was uh, receiving rituximab and so can't generate antibody. And, and she ended up having a positive Lyme PCR and a oh, negative wow. Lyme antibody. It was a very interesting case, but we don't see that very often. The Lyme PCR is incredibly insensitive during erythema migraines. Uh, it is more sensitive during the disseminated phase, and then it's very insensitive again in the late phases. So that's that's so I I personally order a Lyme antibody. We use a very good reference laboratory uh called Imugen, I M U G E N and they 
they what they do is we do a first a screen with the standard ELISA antibody, and then if that's reactive, it then goes to to Imogen, and Imogen does their own uh, versions of ELISA, IgA, IgG, IgM, and IgA, and then they do immunoblots as well. I do want to mention one limitation of the Lyme immunoblot, the Lyme Western blot is that after a lot of places do this two-step testing where the first test is the, is the, is the ELISA and then it's referred for uh, IgG and IgM Western blot testing. The IgM Western blot testing is very prone to false positives. Very prone to false positives. So if you're evaluating someone with early Lyme disease and they come back with a positive Lyme IgM, that makes all kinds of sense. But if you're evaluating someone who's had five years of symptoms and the only positive test is the Lyme IgM, it really doesn't fit with the clinical scenario, and those are most likely false positives. And the labs have been instructed that they should actually put that in their interpretation. You know, a positive IgM in the presence of symptoms longer than, say, three to six months duration uh, may be a false positive. So keep that in mind. That's an excellent point. Right. Yeah, I know that the the labs are just such a big sticking point. Uh, Every time I've talked to a patient or even just a a family member about Lyme, they're always wanting to know about like, well, do, do I need to be tested for it? I, ex- I actually treated a family member about a month ago who had a rash under the armpit with like central clearing. It was pretty classic, didn't have any Perfect. symptoms yet. And I just, I said, she, she was saying, do, do I need to be treated? For, uh, do I need to get tested for this? And I said, no, just, we'll just treat you and, and you should be fine. And so far, so good. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. Those are the cases that are least likely to have complications. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing to mention is that there's no test of cure. So if you have someone who has a positive test and you treat them for Lyme, uh, right. many will have a positive antibody test for months or even years afterwards. And you, it doesn't mean that they still have Lyme. And some people have a negative antibody after treatment. So so it, it, it's, there's, it's no point in doing follow-up testing. That's an excellent point. Walk us through your treatment options for Lyme disease. So the, the drug of choice is every ID doctor's favorite drug, which is doxycycline. Uh, and doxycycline is extremely effective, um, very well absorbed, uh, and has, you know, magical properties. As you all know, it also has anti-inflammatory properties. It has activity against one of the other important tick-related illnesses, which is anaplasmosis. Um, there are some issues with doxycycline. And, and my, you know, spiel <laughs> is that basically I tell people, take this antibiotic. It's once, twice a day. It has two important side effects. One is that it's going to make your skin more sensitive to sun. Uh, and this seems to be uh, in direct relationship to the uh, lack of pigment in people's skin. The paler they are, the brighter their eyes, the worse the doxycycline photosensitivity. So you can imagine here in Boston, we have a lot of people who fit that category very well, and uh, we have to really warn them. Uh, the second thing I say is that this drug can be horribly irritating to your esophagus. So when you take it, uh, you have to be upright, either sitting or standing for at least an hour. This is not a medicine you take and then lie down on the couch and watch TV. It is not a medicine you take and then go to sleep. You can get terrible pill esophagitis. And then the third thing I tell them, if I'm treating them especially for you know, a high burden Lyme disease, you know, the people who are, have maybe low fevers and some n- just more than just the erythromigrans, but everybody is they could get a Herxheimer reaction. Uh, this would be any treatment. Herxheimer reactions is when the immune response to the killing of the Borrelia species. And it's very much like what happens in syphilis when people can get a worsening of their symptoms for, for 12 to 24 hours, a high spiking fever, uh, shaking chills. Uh, it can happen. You got to warn them about it. It goes away with, you know, ibuprofen or acetaminophen and they'll be fine. So those are, that's my, my doxycycline spiel. The alternatives, they can't take doxy, are amoxicillin and uh, cefuroxime orally, which um, those, those two work very well also. The, the, what doesn't work is azithromycin. Uh, that's been tested and it's clearly less effective than, than either of the other choices. For the for the doxy pill esophagitis thing, I I always remind people. I believe it's used for pleurodesis, which is where you scar the lung so that it doesn't collapse anymore. So if if right, isn't that true? They they use yeah. it to burn to burn the parietal and the visceral visceral pleura, so they stick together. So yeah, clearly it can cause Fun pain fact. to the esophagus. Yeah, I mean now clearly any antibiotic can cause nausea. Uh, there is one little fun fact about doxycycline in your hospitalized patients is that it probably protects against C. diff. So that's, that's a good thing about it. How interesting. 
Did you know that? Little known fact. I, I saw you that in your, in your blog post uh, today. So I, I did know that. <laughs> little, little learning unit. <laughs> I think you said it on episode 78 when you, you talked about your favorite antibiotic. Okay, there you go. I, I think, think we so. talked a little bit about the C. diff hierarchy, and that was the, that was the winner of that uh, yes. for being least, least likely to cause, or one of the All least right. likely. Shreya, where you, you get us get us on track here? What's next yes. for our, for this talk? I gotta make gotta make moves. Okay, case two. All right, so Jack's father, Bill, he's a very healthy seventy two year old man. Uh, he's very active, outdoorsy, uh, gardens a lot. Um, you know, at all costs, really avoids seeing doctors. Um, he, he's been gardening a lot this summer and. All of a sudden kind of starts not to feel so well, having high fevers of 101, rigors. And then finally, after much persuasion uh, from Mrs. R, um, he comes to see you, at least after a week or so of, of, of these symptoms. Okay, well, uh, I would say this is a, a very typical story for a often a man, but it could be a woman too, uh, who has basically thinks they have, quote, the flu. You know, the, to our patients, the flu could mean anything. <laughs> you know, it could just mean I don't feel well. Uh, but remember, you know, in the middle of the summer, you don't have a lot of flu. And so there's no way this is the flu. And I want to just emphasize something clinically that, you know, I try to try to teach medical students and residents that, that fevers f- without a localizing source in a person this age is extremely unusual. It almost always means some sort of systemic problem, usually a systemic infection. Uh, and so you should be very, very worried about these stories. These people with 72 year old with a, with more than a week of fever, uh, obviously you're gonna include all kinds of things in your differential diagnosis, but a viral syndrome is probably not it. Uh, and so in the summertime, you should definitely think about, in addition to endocarditis, because I'm an ID doctor, you should also think about tick-related infections. And this particular presentation you just mentioned could be any of the big three. And the big three, of course, are Lyme disease, which we've discussed, anaplasmosis, which is a rickettsial organism, and babesiosis, which is uh, a, a interest, interest, erythrocytic parasite. Uh, so those are the big three. Uh, there are a couple of other things that are out and about uh, that I can mention if we have time, but those three are the ones that every clinician should think about. Do you have a way to kind of think about those three or even some of the other ticks? Like how do you approach what to send for workup? Or is I think that that was the most consistent thing I got from when I was asking people what they want to know about tick-borne illnesses. They were like, please help me figure out a way to keep them all straight. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of overlap in their clinical presentation. You know, anaplasmosis and babesiosis are somewhat more likely to cause fevers. Uh, there are hematologic abnormalities that are seen more commonly, like anaplasma more likely causes low white count and low platelets, babesia more likely low, low hematocrit and low platelets. Um, you know, it's, it, there, there, but there, there's tremendous overlap. And since there is co-infection, you, can, you really can't distinguish. You know, it is easy for me to say this because I'm a, a specialist, but uh, in a case like this, I would recommend that this patient uh, have, in addition to blood cultures, because he's had over a week of chills and rigors, uh, he should have um, a, uh, a an anaplasma PCR, a, a babesia PCR, um, a CBC with a parasite smear, and, and a Lyme antibody at the very least. Some people would also get a liver, you know, a comprehensive metabolic panel, and and that covers the bases uh, pretty well. You know, that's a good first first step. It doesn't mean you have to wait for the results to come back before treating, but this way you have this information on hand. And unlike the Lyme PCR, the anaplasma PCR and Babesia PCR are outstanding. They're very, very accurate. They've really advanced our ability to make these diagnoses. And, it, and they've also showed us a, a wider spectrum of infection in all of these diagnoses. So I, I, I highly recommend it. Now, when I, I dis- discuss this again with my primary care uh, pediatrician wife, she goes, do you know what that costs? And it is expensive. <laughs> it is actually expensive. Uh, unfortunately, um, this group of tests can, is, is a lot of money. And, and I, I don't want to sort of discount that, no pun intended, um, as, as a consideration. <laughs> but it's very, it would be very hard in, in, my, in my clinical uh, setting to avoid sending those tests for a 72-year-old man with a story that you, you said, a lot of outdoor activity, and then more than a week of fever and chills. Um, 
Paul, I was going to ask in Center City, Philadelphia, or North Philadelphia, um, there's most of the patients are living in the city limits, not really giving the history that they've been out out and about in the woods. It, would you? And and you're in Boston. Are you still like if a, if it's a patient who's primarily spending their time in the city? Would you still have this same suspicion? Well, clearly the suspicion is reduced somewhat for people who have no outdoor activities. But I, I always like to tell this anecdote. I and this never would have happened when I first started an ID. But I have a, a patient who lives in in Boston, and he has. I don't know if you, you realize that Fenway doesn't just apply to the Fenway baseball park. It also, there's a, a park, a little park, an urban park that runs nearby. And he has one of the community gardens in that park. Uh, and and he got Lyme disease in that garden. So, you know, I, I think that there is, the, in, in the expansion of Lyme disease, in the expansion of tick-related illnesses, uh, we are seeing it in many surprising areas that we never would have seen when I started my uh, ID career back in the early 1990s. I mean, it's just, it would have been crazy. You would never diagnose someone with Lyme disease who lives in Boston, but now now you can. Thank you. That's that's helpful. I do, of course, have another anecdote, which is I, I was always asking people about exposure to ticks and this particular person is very, very kind of blue-blooded Bostonian. Um, told, I said, do you have too much outdoors? And she said, absolutely not. And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I basically come down from my uh, apartment at the, at the uh, Four Seasons. I get into my car and I go where I need to go. And I said, that's, you probably don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Shreya, where did you. Where did you want to go next with this? We we discussed a little bit about how we could figure out if someone has uh, anaplasmosis or babesiosis. Any other any other testing that that you wanted to talk about? I think we can go on to the to the treatment. Right? Is there anything else that would be good to know about uh, about diagnosis, or can we move on to treatment, Doctor Sachs? Okay, so I, I, me- I mentioned already the fact that, you know, anaplasmosis is classically associated with leukopenia and thrombocytopenia and babesiosis with anemia. Uh, and then I should mention this about babesia before we go back, before we go on. There are clearly risk factors for severe babesiosis that everyone should keep in mind. And the most important is probably splenectomized hosts and patients who have, have uh, poor splenic function. They can get really overwhelming babesiosis. And the other is um, people getting who are immunosuppressed. And the one that is kind of leapt up as a major problem is uh, rituximab. Repl- patients who have or receive rituximab can can have uh, literally months of babesiosis, and and people sometimes need to be on treatment for babesia for months and months and months, sometimes over a year uh, before they actually clear it. So just just keep keep those things in mind. And then of course being old. Being old is bad for everything, and it's really Aww. bad for Babesia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With these testing, I was really hoping that it could be like, okay, if someone is uh, anemic, uh, think of a, think about Babesia. Or if someone has really high fevers, you know, really think about anaplasmosis. But it sounds like with co-infections being so prevalent, we kind of have to send all these tests, even though um, the high high value, you know, care person in me kind of is similar to your wife, Cringing. not as happy with it. Yes. 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 No, I, I, I completely understand. I do. I do uh, think, you know, especially if you're going to choose a non-doxycycline treatment for Lyme, because you remember doxycycline treats anaplasmosis also, and then the treatment of Babesia is completely different. Treatment of Babesia is a sort of funny combination of atovaquone, which is an antiparasitic drug, and, and uh, azithromycin, which is known by everybody because it's <laughs> part of as a thromycin. <laughs> Patients ask for it by the brand it's the name. the key ingredient. Yeah, in right, the brand name, which I'm not going to say online. <laughs> oh, my right. goodness. No buzz marketing for, for azithromycin no. on this show. Thank you. No. <laughs> They're right. not going to get that curbsiders bump that they really need. <laughs> so, turns out his tests come back, and he is actually, Bill, is actually positive both for Lyme and anaplasmosis. All his other antibiotics are DC'd. Uh, his blood cultures are negative too. Um, so he completes his treatment uh, and Ms. R confirms that he has been taking the treatment. But he comes back to clinic and he's saying he's still feeling pretty fatigued, having difficulty concentrating and wants to know, does he have post-Lyme disease residual symptoms? So the quick answer is that absolutely post-Lyme disease residual symptoms are common and they appear to correlate with the severity 
of the initial infection. And at least in my anecdotal experience, very much with the delay and onset of treatment. Uh, and I, I just uh, want to emphasize that the part of the controversy about Lyme disease is born out of people who have had a very bad case, uh, often with neurologic involvement, often with a long delay before diagnosis or treatment. And then they get treated. And then after completing a month of therapy, sometimes even with a, uh, um, um, you know, intravenous treatment, because we treat neurological disease with a month of ceftriaxone, even after that, they're still not quite right months or even years later. It's not common, but it does happen. And the way that we in ID kind of think about it is it's like any other very severe infection, that there are residual effects afterwards that are not due to ongoing living organisms, but due to the equivalent of, uh, of trauma and scar. And, and if you actually talk to people who've had other severe infections, for example, sepsis, toxic shock syndrome, uh, severe pneumonia, uh, they will also often describe terrible long-term side effects that are very nonspecific and very similar to what you hear with uh, people with post-Lyme disease syndrome. So I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, not making sure people understand they may not feel better right away, making people understand that there might be some residual symptoms, but most people get better eventually. Uh, and then in p if people are truly debilitated by these symptoms, then uh, occasionally it makes sense to have them see a neurologist to see if there's anything objective that can be found on a careful neurologic exam. Occasionally it makes sense to do a CSF examination, although in my experience, it's extremely unrewarding. And then you know, uh, in the in the worst case scenarios, you can end up sort of empirically going for another four weeks of treatment. But there is unfortunately no strong evidence that longer treatment than that is going to benefit people. And that is where we get into a lot of the controversy. Now, this post Lyme disease syndrome is extremely different from the quote, chronic Lyme, which is often diagnosed in people who may or may not have had a positive blood test for Lyme disease and is something that uh, is very much championed by Lyme uh, literate uh, clinicians. And I, I, I really, you know, they have a different view of this disease than I do. And, and that's, that's fine. We can have different views. And I just don't feel like I can talk about it with much, uh, much authority based on that. Right. So the, in, in the nomenclature, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this. The post Lyme disease syndrome is somebody that uh, that we would have we would have said, okay, this person had pretty good objective evidence that they had Lyme disease, they've been treated, and now they're having residual symptoms that may or may not be due to this infection that they had with Lyme. And well, probably probably is due to the infection yes. they have Lyme, but it's not due to living organisms in their system. Okay, you got know, it. It's it's like it's a it's a almost it's it's the equivalent of the survivor of sepsis or an ICU yes. stay or a, a a person who has really terrible mononucleosis and other bad infections and they often have residual symptoms for months or even years afterwards. As people will say, I, I I've never felt the same since I was hospitalized in the ICU with pneumonia. You know that 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 comment does does happen. It just does not have quite the same traction as the Lyme disease cases. Um, so, and, and so anyway, that's the post Lyme disease syndrome patient. The chronic Lyme disease is the reason it's controversial is because it's less clear if those patients ever had an actual infection with Lyme disease. And then the treatment for it is sort of not, not endorsed by infectious disease society of America or some of the other big organizations that would give us guidelines for infectious disease. Is that sort of the, the issue? Yeah, and also chronic Lyme implies that there's ongoing living organisms and okay. people who are suffering from these symptoms. They may or may not have had previous Lyme disease. Some of them probably never did. Uh, and, and all of us in ID have anecdotes of people who've been given this diagnosis um, and treated for it who ended up having completely different conditions. Uh, and, and that is act and then or side effects from the medication. And sometimes it's that's one of the downsides, obviously, of treatment for for uh, you know, long-term antibiotic treatment, they get a lot of lot of adverse effects. Great. The other thing I wanted to highlight that uh, Paul was saying was that you know the post Lyme disease residual symptoms are more likely to happen in people who had really severe disease. So someone like um, Jack from Case One who was feeling pretty well, you wouldn't really expect him to have um, this residual symptoms. And I would kind of think about him if he was complaining of fatigue and difficulty concentrating a little differently. But, you know, Bill, his father had like pretty severe symptoms and a severe case of Lyme that 
um, it sounds like we would entertain it more. Yeah, and also a prolo- prolonged time before getting tre- treated. I mean, that's another another factor, um, definitely. No, I actually, I mean, I, I say to people, because there's so much fear about Lyme disease, if they're treated during erythema migraines and are fine, like like your relative, uh, Matt, uh, that, that I just say, this treatment is unbelievably successful. I mean, it's... It, it's going to go away and you'll be fine. Uh, and, and that, that's, I think is, is important to convey that. Oh, can I ask? But when, but, but, but when you're seeing someone in the hospital who has neurologic complication of Lyme disease, it's a different, it's a different conversation. I, I wanted to ask my, my relative, I believe I gave 14 days of doxycycline. And in the, if you look at the range, it's like 10 to 21 days. So can you give us your, inf- <laughs> you know, what do you think? <laughs> if it's a really big rash, 21 days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if people are having trouble with the antibiotics, then it's 10 days. And if they aren't, then it's 21. How's that sound? <laughs> okay. This, the clinical trials comparing 10 versus 14 versus 21 essentially show no difference, but they're not going to show a difference. I mean, it's not really the kind of thing that is going to going to be teased out by a, a relatively small trial. I, I I feel like people who have disseminated disease... Um, who have neurologic disease that, that we should err on the tr- side of treating longer. Uh, and, and so those are the patients who I typically give four weeks of treatment to. But, but I, I, I'm saying this with, with some embarrassment because the length of therapy is, is a very poorly um, described entity. And I would not be uh, you know, totally opposed to treating longer for someone who has a very delayed recovery or totally opposed to treating shorter who has a lot of side effects from the antibiotics. I'm treating someone who has having terrible side effects from both uh, Babesia and Lyme disease and is having terrible side effects from the treatment. And so I'm going to err on the short side. The, the, the Babesia part seemed to be much more prominent than the Lyme part. And you guys just had a case where someone had all three, right? Anaplasmosis, Babesia, and Lyme, right? So so that's something I, I have seen. I, I personally haven't seen one of those recently, but I have seen just it in kidding. my career. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you told me that the other day. Not, 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 no, I actually, it, you know, the, 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 this particular patient was also a transplant patient. He had all three. It was very, wow. very, uh, very complicated case. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's, let's move on to our, our third and last case. So now we have Jill. Jill is Jack's sister, and she calls you from Shelter Island. I don't know why I picked that name from Cash Lack. <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a beautiful place, and it's not well known uh, out, way out there on Eastern Long Island. Okay. Oh, it's a re- it's a real place. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. It's you know between the the forks of the of the fish of Long Island. Wait, you've so got... you just dredged that name up from your subconscious? That's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think I love I it. Know. I don't know where it came from. Anyways, Are so Jill. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I am a little burnt out. <laughs> All right. So, so Jill, you know, she's, she's at this getaway with her girlfriends. She's really anxious uh, because she found a tick behind her knee. Uh, so she calls you because uh, you're a wonderful doctor and do televisits. And uh, what, what do you advise her? You know, she, first, maybe we can talk about treatment. Do you treat her? Yes, no. What are your deciding factors? So the tick is attached? Um, the tick is attached behind okay. her knee. Because ticks that are crawling on you don't transmit anything. Uh, so if you, can, if you can swipe the tick off, that's, that's not an indication for prophylaxis. But attached ticks, you know, it, it, there's this whole thing about 24 to 48 hours for them to feed and transmit the organism. And, you know, come on. I mean, how, how, how can we time that so precisely? And so when patients call and they say they've had a tick attached, it's very straightforward. You can give them 200 milligrams of doxycycline, and it, it, it basically is, is an excellent form of post-exposure prophylaxis. It works very well in reducing the risk of Lyme disease, and that is what the typical practice is. In the clinical trial, there was a little bit more in the way of GI adverse effects. And the people who got that, then people who didn't get anything, but of course they're going to be. They're getting 200 milligrams of doxycycline. So I, I think that's a good idea. The other thing to mention about this is that there are people who live in hyperendemic areas. They typically have you know, houses in the, in the wooded suburbs or they have a farm and they've gotten tick bites over and over and over again. You should empower them by giving them a supply of doxycycline and, mm. and tell them every time they see an attached tick on them, they should just 
pop a couple of these because those those are the people who get Lyme disease multiple times, uh, and, and you know having them call you is ridiculous, uh, and and so I, I just think that they should have it on hand the, 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 in 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 the medicine cabinet. Along those lines, how whomped up do you get about tick morphology just by patient report? Like, do you get excited? Is it a deer tick, a, a dog tick? Is it a big tick, a little tick? Do you care? Or if they say I was bit by a tick, do you just give them a doxy? Uh, the easier approach is the latter. Yeah. Uh, I will say that since you mentioned deer tick, I can comment that the preferred term now is black-legged tick. Oh, how embarrassing. Forget and <laughs> the, deer, the deer lobby have, have argued <laughs> vociferously to get their name off that thing. Yeah. But it actually, make, it actually <laughs> makes deer. sense <laughs> because the life cycle of these uh, organisms and these ticks is sustained as much by mice as it is by deer. So why don't we call it the, the mouse tick? Yeah, and I I think I was reading. I can't remember if this was something that you had written or somewhere else that it just it you don't forget. Oh, maybe it was on Twitter. Don't forget that like someone having a dog, uh, someone having a dog, even if they haven't been in the woods, but their dog's been in the woods, and that can be a risk factor too. I don't know oh, if definitely. we already mentioned that, but yeah, no, no. In, in some some of these hyperendemic areas, even a very brief period outdoors can transmit the the um, these these infections in in during this season. Um, so you know. Uh, it's it's so remarkable yeah yeah so how are you going to advise jill in terms of taking off this tick is it just a simple is there some mechanics to it she wants to know so um the preferred approach is to take a tweezers and lift straight up and the thing that spooks people is that as you lift the tick straight up the skin sort of tents with it and that's because the ticks have this sort of cement that they uh, like latch onto your I mean, they're designed to feed off you and not to be brushed off. Uh, so you have to use a little force. You should not do any of the uh, kind of old stories of use a match or use kerosene or use any of that stuff. Just take it, take it. And if the tick breaks, don't freak, freak out. I mean, that's that's okay. That's the world has one fewer tick, and we should be happy about that. <laughs> you know, and then the little pieces that might be left in will eventually come out. So. That's that's the that's the recommendation. That was Agreed. always the argument: is if you don't cover it in vegetable oil and set your arm on fire, then the tick's head will stick in your skin and embolize, <laughs> and then you'll die. Like it was, there was such a panic about part of the tick being stuck in you. <laughs> in York, Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, I, I, I well, let's not blame York. I think I think that's fairly commonplace, right? That's I, mean, common, I think we all had that growing common up. Common misconception. Um, so her girlfriends also read online that, you know, now that they took the tweezers and did their due diligence with taking it off, should they like put it in a Ziploc bag for you to see? I guess this maybe gets to P-Dub's question about, you know, d will seeing the tick make a difference for you? Not not in the moment. I mean, they're out having fun in Shelter Island, and it's going to take a while for them to get to Boston. They have to take a couple of ferries to, to find their way to Boston. Uh, so and then they, they once the tick is brought in, I mean, it might be, I think, for reassurance, if nothing else, someone could look at it and say, oh, it's a dog tick that doesn't transmit Lyme, but bees or anaplasma, or someone could look at it, and then if they really want to be fancy, send it to one of these tick labs, and they'll test it by PCR for all these infections. But come on. I mean, it's it's there is a pointlessness to some of this testing, uh, right. I, you know, and I mean, also, it, it, I, clinically, not, clinically, probably not indicated, just done for anxiety purposes only. Yeah, I don't think I have the expertise to look at these ticks and, you know, tell them apart. Well, I don't know if you guys do. That's what the internet is for. <laughs> All right, Google, yes. <laughs> Paul Williams that... did back in college, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just send them my way. Just it, I'll, We'll get my address <laughs> at the end. Just you know me the ticks. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Shreya, I All think right. we're going to have to let Paul, Paul Sachs go, not P-Dubs. He's stuck with us. Do we have any other questions that you really want to get to before we let him go? Uh, yeah, let's wrap up with uh, some patient education. So at the end of all of this, you know, what are we going to tell our patients in terms of preventing future tick bites? Is there something that's more effective than, than, uh, than other techniques? Well, the people who work in the field say that, that tucking your pants or long pants into your socks um, is very effective. Now, now when you go on hikes, how often do you see people actually doing that? It's actually not that common. So clearly it's a disincentive, especially in the middle of the summer. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is to use, uh, insecticide, uh, the, the, uh, insect repellent, I'm sorry, DEET based insect repellents are 
felt to be the most effective for ticks. Uh, it's too bad because I think actually picaridin based insect repellents are much more pleasant to use. Those, you know, are just as effective as DEET for mosquitoes, but probably not quite as effective for ticks. So DEET. Um, the other thing is if you're really in one of these horribly tick endemic areas, permethrin impregnated clothing and permethrin itself is unbelievably effective at, at discouraging ticks. Uh, so I, I strongly, strongly uh, uh, would endorse that for, for, you know, for example, you know, the, the horse farmer, I mean, the guy who has a horse farm and he's always out in the woods and in the grass and, you know, he says, all right, come in and I'm covered with ticks. Though, though it really does, does uh, discourage them. Um, I don't know that there's any evidence for these tubes that have the, the you know, the cotton in them. You know about these? There no. is. No, there's these tubes, little cardboard tubes that have cotton in them that are impregnated with a chemical that the mice can use to then build their nests. And then when they use that to build their nests, uh, the chemical ends up uh, being uh, cital to the ticks. They're certainly, they sell them, but I don't know if they're very effective. I think you need to put a lot of those tubes down. Um, the other thing is people should know the anatomic areas we discussed earlier to where to right. look for. Yeah. And then don't, don't, discount a fever in the summertime as just the flu. It's not the flu. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words. Walk in the middle of the trail, you know, all kinds of fun things. Take a shower after being outside. You know, basically, you know, it's common sense. It's right. It's, yeah. So right, right. I, I wish, I wish it could, you know, I'm, I'm talking like living in New England uh, is something that you need to go to a travel clinic before you visit. Uh, but in reality, you know, most people don't get dick-related infections, and it, most of them are easily treatable. Yeah, I'm not going hiking or to Boston anytime <laughs> soon after this recording. Yeah, I actually, I think I feel like I need to check myself for ticks because I was definitely <laughs> running in the woods today and playing in the yard. And yeah, I, I, I am. Yes, I have not. Irish been... behavior. <laughs> I had. I would probably <laughs> worry more about the power lines you hung out underneath as a kid than I would about the ticks. <laughs> no, no, I was I was an adult. My kids were kids when we were hanging out by the power lines. <laughs> oh, thank God! <laughs> it might explain some some issues we've been having with their behavior. So, <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Paul. I really always always appreciate all your wisdom. It's always great. You're you're welcome. It's it's a really uh, important and complicated topic, and one. Uh, Obviously, our patients and our colleagues are asking a lot about. Yes, and it, if it's okay with you, if there's if there's some simple follow up questions that uh, we could maybe we could maybe carry the discussion onto Twitter after this episode airs, which will be uh, probably next week. Very good. Maybe we can answer some quick follow up questions that way. Sure thing. Awesome. Thank you so much for all your time. Thanks. Bye. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. You can get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food and get our weekly show notes delivered directly to your inbox. I legit had hopes that during that pause, Shrey would throw in a yummy and it just it didn't happen. Like I... I felt like it was coming, and it didn't. I, I was too busy thinking about the Surgeon General. P-dubs, P-dubs, I'm totally with you on that. We, we're committed to providing you with high-value, practice-changing knowledge, so we need your feedback. Send an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com, or if it's more convenient, reach out on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I'm Shreya Trivedi. <laughs> and I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams, and goodbye. And I wanted to thank our off-air writers and producers for this episode, Nora Toronto and Hannah R. Abrams, who are two of the wonderful medical student curbsiders, and also to our social media team. Hannah R. Abrams is on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli is on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. Thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs>